This is looking at two of the poems in your blue anthology, Search for My Tongue and Half Cast, uh, and looking at how you could compare them, because that's what you're going to have to do in your IGCSE exam. OK, so if you had a, a question, which was how do the writers of Search for My Tongue and Half Cast present identity in their poems? Uh, then the first thing that I would do is look at the question and uh, the question starts off with how. Um, and so that's steering you towards focusing on analysing language, structure and form. So what you can't do is just tell me what the poems are about. OK, you can't start telling stories. OK, you've got to be analysing how the writer has used particular techniques and words and structural decisions to have an impact on you as the reader. So what you need to be aiming for um, in your essay is to compare as well, because it asks you to compare these two poems. So what I would do is be aiming for at least five or six clear moments during the course of the essay when an examiner is going to be able to look at the essay and think, yeah, they are clearly comparing one poem to the other poem. And that's where comparative collect connectives like the ones that I put at the bottom of this page, words like words and phrases like similarly, in a similar way, in comparison, in both poems, on the other hand, in contrast, whereas they're going to be useful for you to just kind of force yourself, if you like, into comparing and showing an examiner that you're doing that. But the examiner isn't stupid. So there's no point in using those phrases unless you genuinely are commenting on a similarity or a difference in terms of the language that the writers are using or an aspect of form or structure or comparing the different arguments or ideas or points they're making. OK, so your comparisons and your contrasts can be um, looking at all sorts of different aspects of the poems. But you need to genuinely be doing that, not just thinking, well, I'll just slip in in comparison and then I'll get away with it. You won't. So for your first two or three sentences of the essay, the first thing is do not waffle. OK, you don't have much time in this exam. So what you can't afford to do is to start waffling and start making vague points. You're going to get absolutely no marks whatsoever for saying something like in search for my tongue and half cast, the poets talk about identity a huge amount. In fact, uh, they make several different points about identity and they use language and structure and form to really make effective points about identity and engage the reader. You've said absolutely nothing there. You've got to start making some specific points about what these poets are doing and what they're saying. But what I would do is start off by thinking, OK, what do these poems say about identity? So for Search for My Tongue, I'd be thinking, well, there's the sense of initially the sense of shame and frustration um, and a lot of anger as well at feeling disconnected from her roots and her mother tongue. She feels that in moving to another country, um, she's lost this part of herself, doesn't she? OK, so to me, that's the main idea in Search for My Tongue. She's then, of course, very relieved when that language comes back to her, her Gujarati comes back to her. And I think, OK, so what, what is half caste saying about identity? I remember identity could mean anything to do with how you feel about yourself or your past or your roots or your culture or your race, how other people see you, how other people make you feel about yourself because of how, how they define you. OK, it could be anything to do with that. Well, in half caste, I think it's to do with he feels angry, doesn't he? Because he feels that this this derogatory racist term, half caste, OK, he's saying that it makes him and other people feel inferior uh, because he thinks it's got very negative connotations that makes people feel uh, inadequate apart from anything else. OK, so I'd be taking those points and thinking, can I can I turn those two or th couple of ideas there into two or three sentences? Don't waffle, just try and sum it up in two or three sentences. Search for my tongues about this, half casts about this. In your, once you've done that, in your first main section, what you need to do is start from the outside in. So we've been talking about the ideas. Then we need to start talking now about form and structure before we talk about language. So it's the big ideas first. Then how are the poems built up and how are they formed and structured? then getting down to the nitty gritty of the language choices and decisions. 
So we're starting from the outside in. So we start by comparing aspects of form and structure. If you structure your essay in this way, it forces you to do that very early on. OK, and you might therefore get higher marks because some candidates will forget to talk about form and structure at all. OK, so if you devote an early paragraph to talking about that, then it forces you to do that. Um, what you must do, though, is explain the significance of features of form and structure, not just feature spot. There's no point in saying this is free verse. This is a sonnet. This is for octaves. This has got an ABAB -A -B rhyme scheme. There's no point in, in flinging things out like that unless you're going to explain why you think that's interesting. Why is it important? Why did the poet choose to structure their poem in that way or use that particular aspect of form? Why, why have they done it? OK, so some things here that I think you could say, you might have other ideas, but some things that I think you could say about Search for My Tongue, for instance, First of all, there's this kind of three part structure to it, isn't there? So there's a section in English. Then suddenly there's that bit in Gujarati, which kind of suddenly interrupts the poem, which is quite a shock, isn't it? Because you weren't expecting that. And then there's the bit of, in English at the end. Could you make the point maybe that does she feel almost kind of quite split? Does she feel there's a sense of almost divided identity that there's her her English self and her Gujarati self? you know, her, her British and her Indian kind of aspects of her identity. Um, could you say that that sudden section in Gujarati uh, forces us as readers to suddenly start reading in a language that we're probably not familiar with? OK, and that's kind of quite disorientating, isn't it? But what she's doing, of course, is she's forcing us as readers to empathise with her. She's forcing us to go through the same experience that she had to go through when she came to another country and was suddenly bombarded with all these people speaking another language very, very quickly and maybe couldn't make sense of it. OK, and so she's saying this is what it's like, you know, try and get your tongue around these words and, and you know, and try and make sense of it. You can't. That's how I felt. You know, I think that there's maybe an element of that. It's also written in free verse, isn't it, which kind of makes it quite personal and direct and makes it seem like it's the uh, you know, the, the poet or the narrator talking directly to you as a reader. And then in half cast, what could we say about form and structure? Well, um, there's a lack of punctuation. There are all these slashes, aren't there? Um, which I think make it kind of quite speech like. To me, it almost like looks like a transcript, like a, a written record of something that's spoken. Um, and that makes you, I think, hear the voice of the narrator. It again makes it very personal and very direct, like as if he's talking to you. Um, they're quite short lines generally, aren't they? And in my class, when we were talking about this, we were saying, well, how does what impact does that have? The fact that there are such short lines. Someone was saying well, it's almost like the uh, the lines are kind of cut short, almost like as if you get half a line, which I thought was quite interesting. Or does it make you speak the lines very slowly? And uh, if so, is it because he's clearly slowly trying to ex explain his point and get you to see something that you've never seen before or do the short lines make you say it quite quickly maybe um and and so therefore it, does it sort of show his frustration and his anger and just the, you know the depth of uh of passion when he's he's explaining what it's like to be called half cast I don't know. You know, it's, it's your interpretation. But and you could offer a couple of different interpretations there. That's always good for getting the higher grades. Um, he repeats this word explain, doesn't he? So it's explain yourself, explain yourself. And maybe that repetition seems quite confrontational. You know, you as a reader are forced to examine why you've ever used that word or if you've ever thought about uh, how it might feel to be referred to in that kind of derogatory way. To me, I think he starts off with humour, doesn't he? Excuse me standing on one leg, I'm half cast. That's quite a humorous image, a humorous idea. Then he uses a series of analogies, but then at the end, it becomes much more accusatory and it's much more serious, isn't it? I think the end of the poem. So there's some of the ideas that you could make about form and structure. How would you turn those into comparative chunks in your essay? Well, look, I've given you a couple of examples here. These are the kind of things that I would write. So you could say 
Search for My Tongue and Half Cast are both written in free verse, creating a sense of the personal voice of the narrator. In Half Cast, John Agard also emphasises the sense of the narrator directly talking to the reader through the lack of punctuation and the slashes which split the poem into sections in the way a transcript might be written. Both poems, in this sense, are written to be spoken and heard. So can you see I'm talking about aspects of the form here, aren't I? I've mentioned the fact that it's in free verse, I've said about these slashes, I've said about the lack of punctuation, it being like a transcript. I'm saying, look, what do both poems do? What specifically does Agar do in half cast? So I'm making comparisons about aspects of form here. Let's have a look at one more. This is to do with structure. In terms of structure, the first section of Search for My Tongue is negative in terms of its tone. Emotions such as disgust, frustration and resentment seem evident. In contrast, the end of the poem seems much more positive, focusing on awe and relief. While Search for My Tongue shifts from negative to the positive, half cast seems to begin using humour to convey a more serious point, but becomes much more serious and accusatory in the final lines of the poem. So I'm actually talking there about, well, there's contrast in both poems, but one seems to go from negative to positive, and one seems to go from humorous to more serious, if you like. OK, I'm hoping that will kind of show you how you can take those points and weave them together into making a comparison between two poems. Here, what I've put, I'm not going to go through all of these, but these to me are some of the points that you could make if you're writing about aspects of language in both poems, OK, because that's the next section that you'd need to move on to. And this will probably be the longest section of your essay. You're probably going to want to write about maybe three good paragraphs about this. OK, um, just pick up on a couple of things in Search for My Tongue, for instance, there are lots of plosives when it says uh, spit it out, all those t t sounds are plosives and that kind of shows the sense of disgust and frustration that she feels um, of having these two tongues in her mouth these two languages and, and, and she wants to uh, to be able to use her original language but but it, it's it, it's kind of it's rotted away and she feels that sense of disgust and frustration and bitterness about it all and the spit it out the p t sounds really emphasize that don't they okay and then you could look maybe at half cast and think, OK, so what, what, what could we say to link to that in terms of aspects of language in half cast? Well, you could maybe look at uh, at the end of the poem when it says, but you must come back tomorrow with the whole of your eye and the whole of your ear and the whole of your mind. And that that repetition there, that list of three, that repetition um, kind of emphasizes, I think, maybe his uh, his anger and that he's moving on to a much more serious point um, and so you in both you've got a technique being used to show real strength of emotion different techniques but um but strong emotions in both senses now you're going to need to work on how to weave some of this together okay but here are some of the points about language that you could make and this is where you're going to have to do a little bit of work on your own to get to grips with both poems so that you feel really confident doing this. OK, another example, for instance, about half cast that you could make is I think he specifically talks about Picasso when he talks about a half cast canvas. OK, I think he chooses Picasso as the painter because Picasso very much uh, uh, did drawings and paintings where he was looking at his subject, the, let's say the person, the woman or whoever that he was drawing and drew the same person from lots of different perspectives. Yeah. And so um, the top of the head might be from one angle and the nose might be from another perspective and the chin and the mouth might be from another perspective. So you've got lots of distorted images in his paintings where it looked as if parts of the head were going off in all sorts of different directions. Now, I think Picasso was exploring aspects of perspective there. And I think maybe what John Agard is doing is he's trying to get you to look at the term half cast from a different perspective. And I think he's trying to get you to look at him from a different perspective and look at it, look at look at the whole situation from his perspective. OK, 
Can you see what I mean? So that would be an interesting point that you could make about half cast. If you think, oh, I've got this really good point to make about one poem, but I don't quite know how to link it. I would say in the context of an exam, don't worry too much. Just make it and start doing your analysis and explain it. So long as during the course of the essay, you're making five or you've got five or six moments where you're making some clear comparisons. Don't get hung up if you think at some point, ah, oh, but I don't know what to link it to. Just run with it. OK, and so long as the examiner can see that you've, you're making some really good comparisons somewhere, you're going to get the marks for that. OK, um, so comparing aspects of language, then um, let's look at one example. Again, I've just sort of try to write it out as a chunk here so you can see how you can take some points and what you can do with it. So for half cast, for instance, um, he uses this phonetically adapted spelling, doesn't he? Um, so he writes things like yourself spelt Y-U instead of Y-O-U and so on. And you can hear John Agard's voice, can't you, through it. Um, and then in Search for My Tongue, um, the point I want to link this with is the, the awe and wonder and admiration in that final stanza where she uses that plant imagery. So here's my attempt at writing about that, and I'll tell you why I've put some bits in different colours and why I've underlined some bits once I've finished reading it. Have a look at this. In half cast, Agard uses phonetically adapted spelling in words such as yourself to show his accent. In this respect, he is not confirming or adhering to the rules of standard English perhaps out of a sense of pride in his own accent, roots and identity. His decision to use non-standard spelling could be an act of defiance. In Search for My Tongue, the poet reveals a sense of pride in her original language, Gujarati, when she describes it as something to be admired, when she finds it to be growing back like a beautiful flower in the final section of the poem. Her awe and wonder are seen in the plant imagery used when she uses vocabulary with connotations of beauty, such as blossoms. Her excitement and passion are also revealed here through the repetition of the word grows in the tripartite sequence of grows longer, grows moist, grows strong veins. It is as if she is relieved to feel herself reconnected to an aspect of her past identity that she feared she had lost. Now, the first thing is, I'm analysing language, so I've got to pick up particular quotes, otherwise what on earth am I analysing? OK, so I, I put those quotes in red there to show you these are the words, these are the phrases that I'm picking out and saying something about. OK, so look at where I've used those quotes. The second thing is where possible, I've tried to use some terminology to explain the techniques that the writer is using. So I'm talking about phonetically adapted spelling, non-standard spelling, imagery, connotations, tripartite sequence, those kind of things. And then the other thing that I'm trying to do is uh, I've, I've, got, I've got to bring it back to the question, haven't I? I've got to be talking about some aspect of identity. So I'm talking about accent roots and identity. I'm talking about her sense of pr uh, uh, his sense of pride in his uh, original language. OK, her, sorry. Um, and then uh, I'm talking about uh, that sense in Search for My Tongue of reconnection to an aspect of her past identity that, that she feared she'd lost. OK, so I'm, I'm trying to constantly make sure I'm bringing it back to talking about uh, the focus of the question. What do these poets say about identity? So I hope you find that useful. You've got some work to do now if you're going to complete this essay by looking back at all the other aspects of language analysis that you could make here. You're going to have to reread the poems, look at what you want to say about them, make sure you've got really clear ideas about it before you start writing, because if you don't really understand some aspect of the poem, then uh, you're not going to be able to write about it confidently.